Last time, I talked about linguistic hierarchies and movements in favor of marginalized languages. I focused on Haiti as a particularly interesting example. Creole is the mother tongue of the people of Haiti, but French has traditionally been the exclusive language of formal and written contexts. As a result, the country's Creole monolingual majority was effectively barred from education and the judicial and political processes. Over the course of the 20th century, however, there was a linguistic revolution in Haiti. Creole was deemed an official language of the Republic of Haiti in 1987. Although prejudices remain, Creole is widely accepted as a language in its own right, and not a dialect of French. Today it can be used in virtually any context, from graffiti to poetry, from the classroom to the legislative chamber. This linguistic revolution could have happened much sooner. At the beginning of the 20th century, the status of Creole was in flux. Poets and novelists began to use the language in their creative works, prompting heated debates on the relative merits of French and Creole. But history got in the way. The fledgling Creole movement fell apart after the United States occupied Haiti in 1915. In this video, I examine the linguistic revolution that almost took place in Haiti between 1901 and 1915. And in my next video, I'll take a look at what went wrong. First, some background. The Creole-French dichotomy dates back to the colonial period. Creole developed on the plantations, and most of the population spoke it, including European colonists. French was the primary language for written and formal contexts, but Creole was the main spoken language. The language was the vehicle for the Haitian Revolution. The colony's enslaved population rebelled in 1791, and ultimately the colony's black and mixed-race population won their independence from France in 1804. The Haitian Revolution was one of the greatest sleeper hits of history, and I'm going to talk a lot more about it in future videos. But for our purposes here, suffice it to say that Haiti was the first colony to declare its independence from France and permanently abolish slavery. But we're here to talk about languages. After independence, Creole quickly fell back into its second-class status. From the beginning, Haitians were aware of their country's significance as a test case in black self-governance, and they felt an intense pressure to prove their merits as a people and as a society. In a world that was hostile to the new country's very existence, the French language was one of the tools Haitians used to establish their legitimacy. The ruling class emulated French models in everything from fashion to law to literature. French became standard in formal settings, and as a result, the vast majority of the population, who only spoke Creole, were systemically excluded. The linguistic dichotomy is most evident in the realms of education and literature. Haiti's education system was in shambles after the revolution, and language made the problem worse. If you recall from my last video, Language hierarchies can have different configurations. Today, Creole and French are considered distinct languages, and Haiti fits the description of the post-colonial scenario. The prestige language, French, is acquired by the ruling class. But in the 19th century, Creole was considered a vulgar dialect of French, so the country's language situation was seen as a formal-informal continuum. The meager school system operated on the premise that the goal of education was to teach proper French. Creole was banned in the classrooms. This, unfortunately, contributed to an intense polarization between the very small number of children who could succeed in school and the vast majority who couldn't. By 1905, only 5% of school-aged children were attending classes. Haiti's language situation is also evident in Haitian literature, which, historically, can serve as a barometer for the status of Creole. Haiti had a vibrant literary culture in the 19th century. Poetry was the most popular genre, and poets were praised for their mastery of French. The country also enjoyed, and still enjoys, a robust informal literary tradition in the form of oral storytelling, riddles, songs, and fables, all in Creole. But the celebrated poets, novelists, essayists, and playwrights wrote almost exclusively in French. There were a few poems published in Creole, most famously Oswald Durand's Choucoune, but these are notable for their rarity. As a rule, written works were in French, while Creole was relegated to informal settings. Such was the status quo for the duration of Haiti's first century. In 1901, however, the story of Creole turned a corner when the poet and lawyer Georges Sylvain published the first major literary work in Creole. Sylvain was interested in establishing an authentic national literature for Haiti, and knew he would need to bridge the gap between the country's high and low literary traditions. The solution? Fables. Haiti's oral storytelling tradition features a wealth of fables derived from African and European sources, and France has a fabulous tradition of its own. Georges Sylvain took the fables of the great French storyteller Jean de La Fontaine, translated them into Creole, and adapted them to the Haitian context. He published them as a 250-page collection entitled Cric Crac, and shook the Haitian literary scene. It was an immediate success. Here was something new and distinctly Haitian. But Georges Sylvain wasn't just interested in literary innovation. In the introduction to Cric Crac, 
Sylvain explicitly tied the work to a larger social project. The first line of the introduction says it all. Le Creole, est-il une langue? Creole, is it a language? Already in 1901, there was a question of whether Creole should be treated as a language in its own right. He goes on saying, We don't write enough in Creole. We don't consider that in order to raise a people to an understanding of the artistic ideal, to elevate their minds, to reform them to an appreciation of all that is beautiful, you must begin by speaking to them in their language. French, for most of us, is a school language, almost a ceremonial language. We never finish learning it. Then he touches on the broader implications of a reevaluation of Creole. I am inclined to believe, he says, that when we have a number of strong works in Creole, and when it is permitted in the classrooms, we will be well on our way to solving Haiti's education problem. Thus, in a few short paragraphs, Sylvain countered centuries of conventional wisdom regarding Creole, and advanced an idea that greater respect for the language would benefit Haiti's impoverished masses. In so doing, he triggered the linguistic revolution that transformed attitudes toward Creole over the course of the 20th century. Immediately after Sylvain published Cric Crac, other authors began publishing their own Creole fables. Never before had Creole been considered a literary language, but this was starting to change. Before long, Haitian novelists began including Creole in their works as well. The novel was not a popular genre in 19th century Haiti. There were a few early Haitian novels, but they were almost all set in Europe, so they had no use for Creole. But by 1901, a group of novelists inspired by French realists like Balzac and Flaubert began producing novels set in Haiti and made use of the Haitian language. Frédéric Marcelin, Justin Larisson, Fernand Hibert, and Antoine Innocent published a flurry of novels between 1901 and 1908. They established the novel as a Haitian genre and bolstered the legitimacy of the Creole language. But it was in the world of literary criticism that the debate on the value of Creole really hit its stride in this period. Some critics were appalled by what they considered the vulgar use of Creole in literature. Edgar Fanfan, in his review of Justin Larisson's Zune chez Saninan, said scattering Creole words here and there gave the novel a grotesque style. Others were more enthusiastic. In a 1907 article about Georges Sylvain and the New Literary Movement, Duraciné Vaval praised the growing acceptability of Creole and explicitly tied it to a broader social project. Don't we speak Creole daily, he asked? So why are we ashamed to also write in the idiom? He compared Haiti's linguistic insecurity with the situation in Curaçao, where Papiamentu was taught in schools and used in religious services, and where there were even newspapers published in the language. And he wondered whether the same could be achieved in Haiti. It seemed, at least to Duraciné Vaval, that a linguistic revolution was a real possibility. Within a few years, critics of the popular language noted how dangerously close the country had come to normalizing Creole. One reactionary noted that Duraciné Vaval could easily have been appointed Minister of Education in 1908. If he had been, the author says with horror, Haitian students would almost certainly be learning to read and write in Creole. Quelle catastrophe! In other words, Haiti came within a hair's breadth of a linguistic revolution in the first decade of the 20th century. The question was by no means settled in the 19-teens. But like everything else in Haiti, the Creole movement was turned on its head when the United States occupied the country in 1915. In my next video, I'm going to look at the Creole language movement during the US occupation of Haiti, which lasted almost 20 years. The occupation has a complicated legacy. Supposedly, the occupiers were in the country to bring democracy and economic development to Haiti. But, as you can imagine, events on the ground fell short of these ideals. All things considered, Haiti was in many ways in worse shape after the occupation. The Creole movement was no exception. Tune in next time for the full story. This has been Matt Robershaw with another Sleeper Hit History. Don't forget to subscribe and keep learning.